Okay. Welcome to module number eight. We are officially halfway through the course. Believe it or not, halfway through the course. In just another seven weeks, we'll be hitting the final. Uh, some things that I'll let you know now. If you are studying, if you're preparing to take the Security Plus, which you should be, because that's the whole point of taking this class, and you take it before we're done with the course and you pass, you will get an automatic A in this entire course. It doesn't matter that you got 750 as long as you passed the Security Plus exam and not. I'm not talking about my final. I'm talking about the actual Security Plus certification exam by CompTIA. If you pass that test, you will get an automatic A and won't have to submit any assignments or anything else because you got the certification. You achieved the whole point of the class. Uh, if you are... If you are interested, or now you're even more interested, in the home page of our class, I put a link for you to redeem a voucher. It is, I believe, 49% off, which is a pretty good deal for that test. So take a look-see. I highly encourage you. Again, the whole point of this class is to prepare you for the Security Plus exam, the 501. So I would encourage you to sign up, to, uh, to prepare yourself and take and pass the test. Now with that, let's get rolling. Our picture of the week. This is no surprise whatsoever. This week is all about wireless and wireless attacks. Things that we have to watch out for because they are part of our infrastructure. Two thirds of this will be dedicated to nothing but Wi-Fi. That's just how bad Wi-Fi is. But let's begin closer to ourselves with Bluetooth named after the Danish King Harold Bluetooth Gormson. This is a personal area network or a PAN because it works over a very, very short distance. CompTIA, though, or so CompTIA Security Plus, though it is not a network certification, will have questions about networking as it is industry, uh, as the industry mindset is, in order to get into security, you should have the basic foundations of how systems work and how they communicate with one another. This is also why I put it as a prerequisite, some, some form of networking knowledge ahead. So you will be quizzed on Bluetooth about that it's a, a personal area network. You'll also be uh, quizzed about bluejacking, which is sending unsolicited messages to Bluetooth enabled devices, and blue snarfing, accessing unauthorized information via Bluetooth. The easiest defense that exists for Bluetooth is if you don't need it, you turn it off. Everyone tends to forget that. Most people will turn on Bluetooth and keep it on forever in a day. That way, when they jump into their car, it automatically connects. When they put on their AirPods, it automatically connects. Uh, when they connect to their home media system, it automatically does and life moves on. The problem is when you're not connected to those devices and you're out and about, you know, when we're talking post pandemic, and Bluetooth is on, you can be subject to attack. Because just think of it as a door wide open. If you don't need it, if you're not using it, just simply turn it off. It is not that hard 
all mobile devices have it pretty simple to turn on and off. It's just a matter of us doing it and us educating others to do the same. Near field communication, NFC, functions really short, only four centimeters. Devices have to be up to four centimeters apart, allows data to be read or written. This is prevalent in things like contactless payment, which has become much more used now, like Apple Pay, Google Pay, and all those. As it is a wireless communication, it is subject to things like eavesdropping, data theft, man-in-the-middle attacks, and device theft. Oh, I see a message in the chat. Oh, uh, that is a question for er, from earlier. End of the class meeting, the, the day of the final? No. Uh, end of the class being the last day that the class exists, which is, this is week eight, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So uh, the week of December 13th would be the, the latest. RFID, another near field communication. Just like NFC, it works over short distance. RFID is typically what's used in ID badges and inventory tags and book labels and other paper-based tags. Just like NFC, they don't tend to provide their own power and have a limited amount of storage. Nonetheless, they are subject to unauthorized tag access, to fake tags, and eavesdropping. Now with both NFC and RFID, you need to either be nearby or have a really strong antenna to pick up those signals because they don't work pretty far. But with like NFC, if it's on and it's forgotten that it's on, it is possible to bump you know, to get close enough to do an accidental bump and copy that info. That's kind of how the, uh, the tool made, made by Rice Corp works. Now for the rest of this lecture, we're going to be focused on Wi-Fi because it is used extensively. It is everywhere and it is not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. Which also shows you that the 501 is gonna spend a good amount of time uh, talking about Wi-Fi. So to begin, wireless local area networks, knowing how the infrastructure works and the information that is presented on this chart will help you with the wireless questions. Again, be, just because Security Plus is not a networking exam per se does not mean that CompTIA did not put these kinds of questions in there. Like who was first, B or A? Uh, what is the maximum data rate for 802.11n? their different ranges, their frequencies. These are things that you should know. Here is where wireless becomes our issue. In a wired network, it is very clear where the borders of our networks exist simply because if you have a wire, you're connected to the network. If you are not wired in, you're not connected to the network. It is very binary. 
we have our single point of entry. We have our devices. We know that no other device can connect unless they're physically joined. Very simple, very clean. Just not how we work today. With our wireless networks, we have we don't have a straight boundary to our network. Now we have this, this fuzzy border or this blurred edge as this picture shows. Because it depends on the strength of the access point. Here's a question for you to check out tonight. How far does your Wi-Fi signal go? Ideally, it should stop at the end of your property. If you're an apartment, then it should be, it should only go as far as your apartment. If you're in a home, it should go as far as your gate or your fence. More often than not, people set their, their uh, access points or their routers to 100% power and it goes beyond the borders of their premises. It'll go to the neighbors, to the street, across the street. Do you really want that, that far range? The problem being anybody could attack from the street or beyond and you won't necessarily know because it's happening over the air. Now, things that you need to watch out for are rogue access points. These are unauthorized access points that allow anyone to bypass your network security configuration and open the network to users and attackers. This typically happens when an employee or an insider brings in a personal device and connects it to the network. So let's say you have your network perfectly set up and you're happy where it is, but of course, because it's high on security, it's low on convenience. So somebody decides, you know what, this is not working out for me and my phone. They, they go to Best Buy or Office Depot or something and they pick up a, an access point or a router and they realize they can connect their desktop and their access point there. And now they have a free and open access point. That is your rogue access point. There are the evil twins set up by attackers to mimic an authorized access point to trick wireless devices to unknowingly connect to it instead. The example, the prime example of this is the Wi-Fi pineapple by Hack5 who will simulate any access points that it sees and tries to lure systems like phones and laptops and other devices to connect to it. Because the air is the medium for wireless networks, it means anybody within range can access those radio waves. The only way currently to prevent eavesdropping is by ensuring that the wireless connections are properly encrypted. But we'll talk about that later. There's also the wireless replay as part of the evil twin. Once a victim has connected to the wrong access point, sessions can be hijacked to be used later. Because this is all happening wirelessly, it is much harder to detect sessions being taken over. And of course, we also have wireless DOS, which just like your other DOS, it is just a, as annoying and just prevents the legitimate devices from sending and receiving data, just like a, like a jammer, really. Have our, uh, the various items that I just talked about. Moving on with more Wi-Fi. The vulnerabilities that exist 
it is not foolproof. It hasn't been foolproof. And uh, the current iteration is also not foolproof. This is WEP, the Wired Equivalent Privacy. This has been defeated time and time again. Uh, it's the shared secret was only 64 bits in length and only used a 24-bit initialization vector. We're talking small sizes, so it was easy to figure out the pattern and decrypt the messages. Obviously, do not use WEP. That's like saying uh, the equivalent of don't use DES. They are old, they have been broken, should not be used, should not be enabled on any of your devices. WPS came about in 2007 to help make security convenient. And if you know anything from that I've said, uh, security is not convenient. So that went as well as it sounds. By having users enter a pin or physically push a button, the security factor was lowered to the point that this is also insecure. Under WPS, there tends to be no lockout limit. So it's possible to just brute force. The last pin is used as a checksum and the pin itself is broken into two halves of four characters and three character pins meaning an attacker just needs to guess about 11,000 combinations before getting it right. So that means if an attacker can try 1.3 pins a second, they'll figure it out in about four hours, which a good laptop will be able to stay on, uh, on battery power for that much time and figure it out. We also have MAC address filtering, where we only allow devices by certain MAC addresses. But as you know, there's, that's not secure either. It is completely possible and very easy now to spoof MAC addresses. So that's pretty useless. And it causes you as the security or the network administrator, much more work as you have to input all these MAC addresses and make sure that they're all up to date. And, uh, that just sounds like too much work. Another way of security is SSID broadcasting, turning it off to hide the network. Although that doesn't really always generate the desired action that you're looking for. Uh, for example, by hiding the SSID and entering the secret network into devices, then the, the burden of searching for that device goes to the client. So instead of your phone uh, looking for a Wi-Fi that it knows, it starts, it, it starts making loud noise to try to find it. So you could think of your device just becoming even more chatty as it tries to find the access point that you entered, the one that's secret. Devices like the Wi-Fi Pineapple eat that up and quickly and easily will start saying, oh, that's me, join me. Not every access point also has the capability to hide. And not every device is also able to connect to hidden access points. I believe the early versions of the Chromecast are not able to do that. I'm pretty sure the current ones are able to. But nonetheless, that's just one device of many. I'm sure many IoT devices aren't able to connect to hidden access points anyway. Now the solutions that we have so far. Through the Wi-Fi Alliance, they, these folks came together and uh, determined we need to fix WEP. So they created WPA Personal 
for individuals in small office or home office, WPA Enterprise, for larger implementations. The heart of this sucker is the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, or TKIP. This preserved WEPS functionality by adding an additional layer in the following ways. So the key lengths were raised to 128 bits. The initialization vectors were increased to 48 bits to eliminate collisions. And a unique base key was created for each wireless device with client devices forming their own keys derived in the authentication process. WPA also included a message integrity check to prevent man in the middle attacks. It was also made to live within the web world. So pre-shared keys was possible, allowing multiple devices to connect as long as they had the key entered, such as the Wi-Fi password at Starbucks. Well, this did not survive for long. because they put out 802.11i. When they released 802.11i, so did WPA2, meant to improve on WPA in the realm of encryption and authentications. So WPA2 addressed encryption with AES CCMP, uh, the Big long name for this is the Advanced Encryption Standard Counter Mode with Cypher Blockchaining Message Authentication Code Protocol. To be honest, as long as you know AES CCMP is WPA2, that, that'll help you. <laughs> uh, in essence, a 128-bit key is used in four stages to make rounds one through 10, followed by a cipher that provides data privacy to most of the header and the payload, because TKIP only protected the source and destination addresses. Authentication for enterprise is done by the 802.1x standard. Since this already applied to wired networks, they were able to add this on to wireless in WPA2. In order to secure 802.1x traffic and prevent credentials to be stolen, they introduced the Extensible Authentication Protocol, or EAP, as a, as a framework to transport these, these authentication protocols. In Windows, you will find this deployment called Protected EAP. So here is a picture of the three, WEP, WPA, and WPA2. Again, the current standard is WPA2. We're waiting on WPA3. You also have some additional wireless security protections such as rogue access points can be detected by using laptops or other devices to scan and record wireless signals and report to a central database. These can be standalone or centrally controllable. Same with access points. You can, like, uh, I know Linksys has that function. Um, Ubiquity has it. Cisco has it. Uh, Aruba also, where you can manage your access points centrally. You can create captive portals, like the ones you see in uh, like Starbucks or hotels where you have to, uh, the, there's limited capacity to log in and everyone has a certain amount of time. Lowering the power level does not reduce your bandwidth. Lowering the power level just means it reduces the distance that the signal will go, but your bandwidth is not affected by that. Now with all these solutions that we've talked about and all these protocols in place and all that shenanigans, it is broken thanks to crack 
and Kruk. Two vulnerabilities that have affected WPA2 and practically rendered it useless. Currently, our security for WPA2 is basically meaningless as long as somebody knows how to use the, the crack vulnerability to get in. Yes, there are a lot of devices that have been updated, but not every device at home has been updated to prevent uh, these attacks from occurring. So it is still a prevalent threat, especially now that we've been home for a couple months and our home users aren't necessarily thinking about securing their Wi-Fi access points. Isn't this fun? 